In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and planted us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, the trampling down our carnal desires, who may enter a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as well pleasing unto thee. For thou with the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory together with thine originate Father, and thine holy good and life, King Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. All right. So again, we're going to talk about St. Demetrius. Today is his name day. And you know what? It's a, it, it, this is a huge day in Orthodox world. Um, he is a patron saint of Thessaloniki or Thessalonica. Um, if you ever look at the Bible, you know that there are two letters that St. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. It's the same city. So that's pretty cool. Um, it is also the home of St. Gregory Palamas, another major saint of our church. Um, so it's a great city. And if you ever get a chance, yeah, like all of us, to go to Greece, you should go see Thessalonica. It's an amazing place to see. Um, it's also like an Orthodox Christian. It, it's like a dream come true for Orthodox Christians because you have like term priests can get pectoral crosses there. And, I mean, it's it's just a really beautiful place. Never been there myself, but I've heard a lot of people describe it. Okay, so um, let me pop his picture up here. Sorry, I forgot to get that done. Um, no, you don't need to. I'll show you something. So, St. Demetrius. That's all right. Okay. So this is the icon that I'm showing everyone else. You can just sort of look at it together. Okay, and this is also another icon of him. Jonah. Yes, he is. Well, that's he's a soldier. He's carrying something. And he's he's killing somebody. Got a spear in his hand. He's got a knot in his horse's tail. Okay, so we're gonna read all about that. So, okay. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or wanna um there's anything I can do to clarify things, just feel free to interrupt. This is an informal gathering. Um, so here we go. Okay. All right. So the great martyr Demetrius, the myrrh bearer or myrrh gusher of Thessalonica, is the son of a Roman proconsul in Thessalonica. Three centuries had elapsed and Roman paganism, spiritually shattered and defeated by the multitude of martyrs and confessors of the Savior, intensified its persecutions. The parents of St. Demetrius were secret Christians, and he was baptized and raised in the Christian faith in a secret church in his father's home. Okay, so let me make um, one thing already. Um, one of the coolest things about Christianity is it basically took over the entire Roman Empire, and there is not a single battle, a single war fought battle between the army of the Christians and the army of the Romans. You ever notice that? A lot of times we tend to think that in order to get someone to think like we do, we have to sort of use war as the means to do it. Christians didn't do it. They did it through their example, through their martyrdom. Um, it says here, you know, what happened? The multitude of martyrs and confessors of the Savior. So they lived their life authentically. And because they lived their lives authentically, people converted to Christianity. That's a big message for us to listen to. I think we tend to think that force is the way to do it. It's exactly the opposite. The way to do it is to live humbly and to be willing to die for your faith, which is, you know, not exactly the happiest topic, but there you have it. So this is St. Demetrius's experience. 300 years in, you know, since the life of Christ, um, the empire was shattering and the Christians were growing everywhere. And so this is, you know, what happens? They try to squash you and it just doesn't work. It's like squeezing jello in your hands, you know? You should do that when you go home. Get some Jello, squeeze it in your hands, and see if you can actually make it not go through your fingers. <laughs> Doesn't work. So. Okay, so that's your homework for tonight. Tell me if you can squeeze Jello without it going through your fingers. Okay, by the time Demetrius had reached maturity and his father had died, Emperor Galerius Maximian had ascended, or Maximian had ascended to the throne in three hundred five. Maximian. Confident in Demetrius's education, as well as his administrative and military abilities, appointed him to his father's position as proconsul of the Thessalonica district. 
The young commander's principal duties were to defend the city from barbarians. Oh, oh, and by the way, to eradicate Christianity. I don't think that worked. The emperor's policy regarding Christians was expressed simply. Put to death anyone who calls on the name of Christ. The emperor did not suspect that by appointing Demetrius, he had provided him with the opportunity to bring even more people to Christ. Accepting the appointment, Demetrius returned to Thessalonica and confessed and glorified our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of persecuting and executing Christians, he began to teach the Christian faith openly to the inhabitants of the city and to overthrow pagan customs and the worship of idols. The compiler of his life, St. Simeon Metas Metaphrastes, whose name day is on November 9th, says that because of his teaching zeal, he became like a, the Apostle Paul or a second Apostle Paul for Thessalonica, particularly since the Apostle to the Gentiles founded the first community of believers in the city. See again the letters of First and Second Thessalonians. The Lord also destined St. Demetrius to follow Paul on the path to martyrdom. When, when Maximian learned that the newly appointed proconsul was a Christian, and that he had converted many Roman subjects to Christianity, the emperor's rage knew no bounds. Returning from a campaign in the area of the Black Sea, the emperor decided to lead his army through Thessalonica, determined to massacre the Christians. Learning of this, St. Demetrius ordered his faithful servant Lupus to give his wealth to the poor, saying, Distribute my earthly riches among them, for we shall seek heavenly riches for ourselves. He began to pray and fast, preparing himself for martyrdom. Okay, so let's backtrack here for a second. The Black Sea. For a little bit of information, now, if you look at modern-day Turkey, Okay, so Turkey is sort of a bridge between Asia and Europe. Okay, so you have um, Rome, you have Greece, and they have Turkey. Okay, and um, right north of Turkey is the Black Sea. Okay, now the Black Sea is one of those things right now that's in the news because of the war. I mean, there's the Crimean Sea too, but the Black Sea is nearby. And so you even there you have, um, you know, going into Ukraine and eventually into Russia. So you've got all of that in the same proximity, okay? All right, any questions so far, anybody? No, it's pretty straightforward. You can sort of see how it's gonna go. When the emperor came into the city, he summoned Demetrius who boldly confessed himself a Christian and denounced the falsehood and futility of Roman polytheism. You know what polytheism is, it's the um, it's a worship of many gods, you know, in, in um, Roman lands, you know, all, most of the planets are Roman gods. So there's Mars, there's Jupiter, there's Venus, there's Saturn, Mercury, Neptune. They're all named for Roman gods. Now you've also heard of the Greek gods, Hercules, Zeus, Aphrodite, Diana, you know, people, uh, the, the figures like that. So, um, like Hermes in Greek mythology is similar to Mercury in Roman mythology. Um, Ares is the god of war in Greek mythology. Mars is the god of war in, in Roman mythology. Okay, so when we say polytheism, we mean many gods. Okay. Oh, oh. Another another thing to think about in that regard is each one of those gods had a major character flaw. In fact, some of them had many character flaws, but they were always sort of like amplified human beings. They were jealous and they were malicious. They were, you know, um, excessively um, amorous, whatever. I mean, all of that stuff. So, um, but they not, weren't they weren't real, were they? No, we wouldn't say no. they were. No, I mean, they're no. really the amplification of bad characteristics in people. Yeah. Okay. So no, we would not say that they were real. Um, but, you know, they said that they were real. Yeah. The Romans and the Greeks did. But, um, and let me also make it clear that those gods that I'm mentioning are not, you know, Greek, in Greek philosophy, 
there are all sorts of others who don't believe in the polytheism. This is sort of like groundswell and political. Um, but you have like Stoics and you have, um, I mean, you think of some Epicureans and um, people like that. And they didn't believe in all this polytheistic stuff. But, um, you know, actually there's a story where the Apostle Paul is, um, I, I can't remember if it's Athens, but he's in a town where there are a lot of monuments to different gods because they're polytheistic. One of them is literally a monument to the unknown God. And St. Paul is really struck by that. And he says, oh, well, you, you say the God is unknown. You do not know his name. Well, I do know his name and his name is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So yeah, yeah. that's kind of fun. Yeah. Okay. All right. So continuing on with the narrative here. Uh, let me bring Nancy in. Okay, continuing on with the story. Meanwhile, the emperor amused himself by staging games in the circus. His champion was a German by the name of Laios. He challenged Christians to wrestle with him on a platform built over the upturned spears of the victorious soldiers. A brave Christian named Nestor went to prison to St. Demetrius, his instructor in the faith, asking for his blessing to fight the barbarian with the blessing and prayers of St. Demetrius. I'm sorry, I should have said that again. Wishing to fight the barbarian. With the blessing and prayers of St. Demetrius, Nestor defeated the fierce German and hurled him from the platform onto the spears of the soldiers, just as the murderous pagan would have done with the Christian. The enraged commander ordered the execution of the holy martyr Nestor and sent a guard to the prison to kill St. Demetrius. At dawn on October 26, 306, soldiers appeared in the saint's underground prison and ran him through with lances. His faithful servant, St. Lupus, gathered up the blood-soaked garment of St. Demetrius, and he took the imperial ring from his finger, a symbol of his high status, dipped it in the blood. With the ring and the other holy things, sanctified the blood of... I'm sorry. With the ring and other holy things sanctified the blood of St. Demetrius, St. Lupus began to heal the infirm. Emperor ordered his soldiers to arrest him and kill him. The body of the holy great martyr Demetrius was cast out for wild animals to devour, but the Christians took it and secretly buried it in the earth. During the reign of St. Constantine, 306 through 337, a church was built over the grave of St. Demetrius. A hundred years later, during the construction of a majestic new church on the old spot, the incorrupt relics of the holy martyr were uncovered. Since the 7th century, a miraculous flow of fragrant myrrh has been found beneath the crypt of the great St. Demetrius. This is why he is called the myrrh gusher or myrrh bearer. Several times, those venerating the holy wonder worker tried to bring his holy relics or a part of them to Constantinople. Invariably, St. Demetrius made it clear that he would not permit anyone to remove even a portion of his relics. It is interesting that among the barbarians threatening the Romans, Slavs occupied an important place, in particular those settling upon the Thessalonian Peninsula. Some even believe that the parents of St. Demetrius were of Slavic descent. While advancing toward the city, pagan Slavs were repeatedly turned away by the apparition of a threatening, radiant youth going about on the walls and inspiring terror in the enemy soldiers. Perhaps this is why the name of St. Demetrius was particularly venerated among Slavic nations after they were enlightened by the gospel. On the other hand... Greeks dismissed the idea that St. Demetrius was a Slavic saint. Okay, we Antiochians don't care. The very <laughs> first pages of the Russian primary chronicle, as foreordained by God, is bound up with the name of the holy great martyr Demetrius of Thessaloniki. The chronicle relates that when Olag the Wise threatened the Greeks at Constantinople in 907. The Greeks became terrified and said, this is not Olag, 
but rather St. Demetrius sent upon us from God. The Russian soldiers always believed that they were under the special protection of the holy great martyr Demetrius. Moreover, in the old Russian barracks, the great martyr Demetrius was always depicted as a Russian. This, thus, this image entered the soul of the Russian nation. You can tell that I'm reading this from the OCA website. Okay, the church veneration of the holy great martyr Demetrius in Russia began shortly after the baptism of Rus or the beginning of the church in Russia. Towards the beginning of the 1070s, so a mere thousand almost years ago, the Dmitriev Monastery at Kiev, known afterwards as Mikhailov Zlatoverk Monastery, was founded. The monastery was built by the son of Yaroslav the Wise, the great prince of Izyaslav, Iz Demetrius, in baptism. The mosaic icon of St. Demetrius of Thessalonica from the cathedral of the St. Dimitri of Monastery has been preserved up to this present day and is in the Tretiakov Gallery. In the years of 1194 through 1197, the great Prince Vladimir Vesvolod, sorry, I'm really bad at Russian, the third, the great nest or Demetrius in baptism, built at his court a beautiful church, the holy martyr Demetrius, and adorned it wonderfully with icons and frescoes. The Dmitriev Cathedral also reveals the embellishment of ancient Vladimir, the wonder-working icon of St. Demetrius of Thessalonica from the Cathedral of Conestasis is located even now in Moscow at the Tretiokov Gallery. It was painted on a piece of wood from the grave of the holy great martyr Demetrius brought from Thessalonica to Vladimir in 1197. One of the most precious depictions of the saint, a fresco on a column of Vladimir, Domitian Cathedral, was painted by the holy iconographer Andrei Rublev, who has done many, many great um, icons. And I think a lot of this is getting a little bit too Russian for my taste, so we'll stop there for a second. But let me just make a couple of points about this. Now, the thing to keep in mind about the Orthodox world is that we do have this relationship between the church and the government. Um, it's nowhere more profound than that of Constantine, when Constantine um, basically declared that Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. That is also the case in places like Russia. Um, even to this day, you see the very strong connection between the, the patriarch of, of Moscow and now, right now, Vladimir Putin. Um, but you also have it in Ukraine. There's a very strong connection between the government and the church in Ukraine, very strong connection to the church in Greece and the Greek Orthodox Church, and so on and so forth. So for us, you know, American Christians, it seems a little weird because we have this idea that somehow religion is separated from the politic. Uh, you know, if you if you push it hard, you realize that's not really the case. But, you know, we don't want one particular religion dictating the terms of what happens in our country you know um i i was not alive at the time but i always remember people being afraid of john kennedy when he became president that somehow he would be a puppet for the for the for the catholic church well obviously that was not the case but um you know there's there's always that fear of of some kind of integration okay so that said the thing to keep in mind, though, is that when you do have that tie between the church and the state, a lot of times you'll have a saint serve as the protector of the country. You know how each of us has a patron saint. Okay, mine's Gregory of Nyssa. You have, um, there's a saint, there's a, a prophetess, Deborah. Um, so maybe you're named after that. I'm not sure. Do you have a patron saint that you know of? Know. Do you have a middle name? Elizabeth. Well, Elizabeth. I mean, so it would be Zacharias and Elizabeth. Okay. So in in those cases, those saints are, uh, we have a special bond with those saints. Okay. I mean, Mother Barbara has one. Um, Nancy has Irene Christopher Lantu, or at least that's what we've said in the past. Um, 
we have, I'm, I'm not sure, well, Marilyn would be a derivative of, Maril, of Mary. Um, mm -hmm. So it could, be, it could be that. So we have, um, you know, each one of those is a patron of, um, you know, of us. So it would be the same in Russia and it would be the same in, um, you know, if you look at Greece, there are a lot of men named Nicholas because they have a special affinity to St. Nicholas. In Syria, St. George is a major figure. St. Elias is a major figure. So it could be one of them. In Russia, there's the protection of the mother of God. So um, and they talk about mother Russia. Um, it, you know, before the communists took over, mother Russia was the Holy Theotokos. Once the communists did take over, Mother Russia was just more of a, a figurehead. Uh, so instead of them being patriots, they'd be matriots. That's another thing to think about. When we talk about patriotism, it means a love for your fatherland. Okay. Matriotism would be a love for your motherland. Okay. I very I don't think there are very many matriots in the world, to be honest. But um but St. Demetrius then takes on a special identity in Russia, more in a military sense than anything else. He's a protector in a military term. So whenever there's a battle or a campaign, he becomes the patron. And so you can see that in his, um, in the way that he is depicted, you know, on a horse, just like St. George, um, you know, in this case, he's killing a soldier, um, who would be uh, an, an opponent. Now, who is that soldier? Well, that soldier is likely not a human, but instead either a demon or the devil himself in human form. Okay, so you see that it's the same thing with St. George, where St. George is killing a dragon. Mm -hmm. St. Demetrius is killing a person, but the person is really incarnated vice, incarnated evil. So he's destroying passions in what he's doing. He's not killing a person. He's killing the passions. Okay. So um, that's just an important little piece of information there. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Okay. So you can understand, you know, especially from the OCA's perspective, they are the church of Russia and America. So they have a strong connection to the Russian um, ways of life. And so St. Demetrius would have a very important part to play in their, um, in, in their self-understanding, really, in the way that they understand their relationship between God and themselves. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? Tell us why he is a Well, let's see if we can look that up. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure. Are those bandages? Those look like bandages around both their feet. Is that bandages or is that? No, really those are just, that's that's their, the, that's like their foot covers. Yeah, that's okay. really their foot covers. Okay. And I just discovered, I printed out two things, one very large and one very small, and they're saying exactly the same thing. So I don't have much more to go on, but I'm going to read this from. Um, I believe this is a Bulgarian website that has some information about, um, because today, like I said, is a very important day in Bulgaria. It's, it's a major holiday. Um, like we would have, boy, I can't even, I mean, more, more important than St. Columbus or St. Columbus. Well, yeah, than Columbus day. All right. So I'll read that here. Okay, the traditional calendar of Bulgarians in the past had several important dates in the transitional period between the change of the seasons. Climatic conditions on Bulgarian lands quite naturally split the cycle of nature into two major parts. The first part starts on May 6, which is St. George's Day. Now it's old calendar. When the spring arrives and all nature awakens for life. The second borderline is October 26th, or the day of St. Demetrius. This is determined to be the end of the active agricultural season and the start of winter, evening gatherings, and engagements ah, of young couples. Just as every new beginning, St. Demetrius's Day was a source of much hope. On this day, people would make predictions as to the future of fertility, health, love, the weather, the coming of St. George's Day. So everything would be predicted now, and we'd see if it comes to fruition on the 6th of May, because in folk beliefs, George and Demetrius were twin brothers. 
That is why the predictions made on St. Demetrius's day were valid for the day of his twin. Okay. St. Demetrius's day is a big Christian holiday. On this day, Bulgarians traditionally venerate the memory of the holy martyr Demetrius, who was born in Thessaloniki in the 3rd century AD. He died as a martyr for the Christian faith, and upon his grave in Thessalonica, a small church was erected. The place of this small church, a magnificent basilica, stands today, where the relics of St. Demetrius are kept. This, in a nutshell, is the official Christian role in Bulgarian beliefs. In Bulgarian folklore, however, St. Demetrius has been given a special place, and the whole month of October is sometimes called the month of Demetrius. That'd be pretty cool. I have a month of Debbie. Yeah. In folk beliefs, <laughs> in folk beliefs, St. Demetrius is the elder brother of St. George. Both are strong, beautiful, and fearless men. Along with St. Theodore and our beloved St. Elias, they are the Christianized equivalent of the brave men in Bulgarian mythology, strong and dexterous. In battle, with their fast horses, they can jump over mountains, conquer evil, and fight dragons. In folk tales and legends, the two saints have the power to open and close heaven, make it rain and snow, and ensure fertility. The task of St. Elias was to protect the fields of corn from the evil creatures who stole the harvest. His brothers, twins, George and Demetrius, also strong enough to defeat the mythological monsters. They are represented as warriors and victors, also in Christian iconography. St. George is riding a white horse, St. Demetrius a red one, both holding a spear in hand. The most popular legend of the brothers, George and Demetrius, contains facts from the life of St. Demetrius. It tells us all about the family of a poor fisherman who had no children. The man and his wife constantly prayed to God to give them offspring. One day, the fisherman caught only a very small fish, which spoke in a human voice and begged him to let it go. The man did so. The next day, he had no luck again. He caught only the small fish again. The third day, the same thing happened. This time, the fish asked the man to take him to his house. He did so, and after a while, the mayor gave, his mare gave birth to two foals and his wife to two boys. They named them George and Demetrius. When they grew up, they set off on a long journey, and they agreed that they would divide the world into two halves. Everyone would live in his own half. Once, when St. George was in danger, St. Demetrius fought with a dragon and saved his life. Then they mounted horses, flew to heaven, and became saints. There you go. In, in Bulgarian fairy tale, St. Demetrius is also endowed with unearthly spiritual powers. His image is reminiscent of proto-Bulgarian high priests, legendary healers, and fortune tellers. He can even predict the weather. That is why Bulgarians used to believe that if the weather on St. Demetrius' day was nice, it would also be nice on St. George's day. And who knows? These predictions may well be true. Or they could be just seen as another bridge between the known and the unknown reality that has for centuries put man in anticipation and suspense and hope for a better future. Okay, so that's a little article on that. And then I have one last thing about um, the life, the, the two, the life of the two together. Okay, this is from uh, Father Photius Kantoglu. St. Demetrius together with St. George are two brave young lads of Christendom. They are down here on earth. And the two archangels, Michael and Gabriel, are up in heaven. In ancient times, they were painted without arms, weapons. But later years, they were depicted with swords and spears and dressed in iron shirts. On one shoulder, they have their helmet. On the other, their shields. In the middle are the straps that support the chief of the sword. Here, let me show you. Um, I'm going to show them in a second. But you out there in internet land, you can see this particular icon right here. Okay. You can take a look at that, then I'll resume reading in a second. I'm almost done, and I'm going to fix it. I'm just about done, yeah. So his brother was also a saint. Yeah, I mean, it's but, technically not his brother. George oh, okay. and Demetrius are two different figures in oh, church history. Yes. Well, that's according to the mythology of the Bulgarians, oh, okay. okay? That's like a Bulgarian folktale, okay? <laughs> but I'm just trying to point out that they were oftentimes held together. Um, even we do it in the Orthodox world, but for the most part, 
it's different. Okay. So um, in recent years, after the siege of the city of Constantinople, these two saints and many times other military saints are painted riding on horses, St. George in white, St. Demetrius in red. And one is fighting a beast and the other a warrior, Laeus. We talked about him again. We'll go back to that in a second. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's a um, recitation of St. Paul. This heroic and pious character of the warriors who are martyred for Christ's meek lambs refers to their spirituality. So it is, as I was saying, if you recall, with St. George, we have um, the dragon represents the passions. In the case of St. Demetrius, it's Laius, but Laius also really doesn't represent a person as much as he does the passions because if you think about it when <clears throat> you're dealing with um pagans one of the things that they saw about the pagans is that they were um saturated in sinful practices okay they practiced human sacrifice um they killed many people without cause they didn't care for their neighbor they were sort of the opposite of the Christian faith. And a lot of times when we were, are trying to emphasize our virtuous life, our life in you know love and peace and all of that, we compare it to a life of vice. The opposite of love isn't um, hate necessarily, but it's like coldness towards your neighbor or a lack of care for your neighbor. Um, but you know, all of the virtues that we have can seen be seen as an um an opposite of something that exists in the world. So as I was talking about that, I referred back to what I read at the very beginning about the German that was competing in the um, arena and wrestling, that's Laius. So in the icons, it's showing Demetrius killing this great warrior of the Germans of the Roman Empire, where in reality, it's it's the disciple of Demetrius, according to the story. This is Nestor, who is the fighter against the German warrior. Um, it's him that hurls him out of the match, and he falls on the spears and dies. But remember, Nestor went to Demetrius to get permission to do the fighting. Okay, So the icon is depicting sort of a shortcut. Because of the blessing that Demetrius gave, Laius died, okay? Because um, he was a sinful and, and arrogant person who was going to kill him, Nestor, and many others. So the icon shows him putting Nestor to death when in reality Nestor was, or not Nestor, putting Laius to death, but in reality Laius was thrown out of the arena or thrown off this platform onto the spears by Nestor not by Demetrius. So the icon is a truncation of the account, but it shows, again, I mean, since Laius is a pagan and since he's you know representing the lack of virtue on the part of the pagans, what we are seeing in this icon is a return to um, the need to be virtuous. Yep. And so he's putting to death the passions as we should put to death the passions in our own lives. Okay. We should struggle and fight with the passions because a lot of times we give in to them and as a result, we suffer and others suffer, okay? So that's probably enough. I mean, St. Demetrius, there's not a whole lot known other than what I've recited. He was a proconsul. Um, he was despised by the guy who originally liked him, you know, so that's embarrassing and he got upset about it and put him to death. And that's pretty much it. So... I can feed quest. I can I can feel field questions if you have any questions, 
or um, anything that you want to talk about for a few minutes, you can do that. Or we can just call it a quick night. Call it a night. A serio. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you for joining me. Next week, we will talk about St. Maria Skopsova, and we'll look forward to joining you then, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. Thank you. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, Father.